This Jewish History Podcast is dedicated in honor of my dear friend and weekly study partner, David Astin. I deeply appreciate your friendship and your continued stalwart support of Torch throughout the years. If you want to sponsor a podcast or if you want to reach out with any questions or comments, do not hesitate to email me. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. The Midrash offers a fascinating insight into the stories of Genesis that both make the stories more meaningful, but also offers us deep insights into Jewish history and even into how to best navigate modern-day political, cultural, and religious dilemmas. The Midrash tells us, Call Mashi'ira la'avos Simon Labanim. Everything that happened to the forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, is a guide to their children. In a second rendition of this idea, we read, Lo nafal davar mikol av, shelo yihyeh babanim. There is nothing, not a single event, that happened to the fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, that will not repeat itself, in the children. There's a common refrain that history repeats itself or the history rhymes. Here we're told that specifically with respect to the forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, exactly what happened to the forefathers, to them as individuals, will happen to them as heads of a nation. They are the roots. They are the seeds of the Jewish nation. And exactly, precisely what is manifest in the roots and the seeds is going to be manifest in the finished product. Thus, the stories of Genesis are not just stories about individuals who lived thousands of years ago, but rather it's a template, it's a blueprint for all of Jewish history. Future history of the Jewish nation finds its roots in the narratives and the interactions and the ordeals and the struggles and the triumphs and the tragedies of the forefathers in Genesis. And in fact, the medieval commentator, the Ramban, we actually did a Jewish history podcast episode on him. He, in the beginning of the narrative of Abraham, chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 6, he lays this out as his thesis, that everything that happens to all the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is foreshadowing what's going to happen to their children. And he explains, you read about, you read Genesis, and it seems like there's a lot of extra information that could have been edited out. There's a lot of fat, you would maybe argue, that should have been skinned off. There's episodes of all their trips and all the various places where they lived and all the people that they met and all the things that happened to them when they went to Egypt, when they went to Gerar, the various quarrels that they had about various wells and things like that, things that seem to be extraneous. And he explains that really what we're being told in these stories is not just isolated incidents, isolated episodes, two individuals thousands of years ago, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rather, these are principles of Jewish history that we will constantly be revisiting time and time again. And therefore, it's a guide for us how to behave in these instances. Thus, the minutia of the travels and the ordeals and the interactions of the forefathers are very informative to matters of Jewish history, both past and present. So what I wanted to do today is go through a survey of some of these events in Genesis and how they portend to future events that have already happened in history, but also to try to derive from them the guidelines and the principles laid out by our forefathers of how we are supposed to today with the dilemmas facing our nation of how our forefathers are guiding us to behave. Churchill famously said about history that the longer you could look back into history, the farther you could see into the future. And that idea applies in history in general because people are the same even though circumstances and times change. And therefore, if we could kind of look back and see the mistakes of the past and we could learn from them, well, we'll avoid those mistakes in the present 
and in the future. And that, that, that's true across the board, not just with Jewish history. But there's an added wrinkle here that almost prophetically in the book of Genesis we're being told and the, the, the chess pieces are being manipulated in a way that it's directing us of how to behave in events that are going to happen after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for us, of course, we have a lot of hindsight to see how it actually played out in history, but also to look towards the future to know what moves we should make. So in general, I want to look at a retrospective of, of all of Jewish history and really all of all of the world history, see how it relates to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then go to more of a granular detail in some of the famous conflicts that are part of the narrative of Genesis and see what they tell us about the ge- geopolitical, religious, cultural, and other conflicts that we still face today. So the Talmud, in the book of Sanhedrin, page 97a, says the following pithy statement. They taught in the academy of Elijah. Shis alfin shonen hava alma. The world is a 6,000 year world. 2,000 years of tohu, 2,000 years of emptiness, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of Messiah. And then it talks about the 7,000 years. But for our perspective, the Talmud is breaking down world history, but by extension, certainly Jewish history, with a focus on Jewish history, into three different epochs. There's the epoch of emptiness, of Tohu, for 2,000 years. There's the epoch of Torah, for 2,000 years. And then there's the final epoch of Messiah, for 2,000 years. These are... Not just three different eras, but they're also three different phases or iterations of our nation's existence. What this is telling us is that there's a certain framework that Jewish and by extension world history will fall into. And it also is going to show us about the role that we have to kind of bring the world from emptiness to Torah to Messiah and the destiny and we can kind of map out where are the most important milestones along this trajectory, along this progression from one stage to the next. So on that particular teaching, Rashi's comment is very incisive. He does the math for us, the tabulation for us, but if you count from Adam until the birth of Abraham, How many years after the creation of Adam was Abraham born? 1,948. 1948. Easy number to remember. Then Rashi tells us that how old was Abraham when he discovered Torah? Like we spoke about last time, Abraham discovered Torah. Maybe in a different way than we do, but there was a certain connection between Abraham and and Torah. But how old was Abraham? He, he didn't start as a baby. He quotes the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that Abraham was 52 when he discovered Torah. 1948 plus 52 is exactly 2,000 years. What Abraham, his role in the big retrospective of Jewish history is he is the individual marking the transition from a world of emptiness to a world of Torah. Before Abraham, there was no one who stepped up, took responsibility for the world, took the mantle of monotheism and says, I am going to end this emptiness. It was an empty world. There was no one who was at the forefront of this, what we call the Abrahamic legacy and destiny, the efforts to spread the acknowledgement, the recognition of God, in the world, Abraham comes and he closes one era. The emptiness is gone. Now there's a bright beacon of light spreading the message of God in the world. And he opens up a new phase, the phase of Torah. Well, what's special about Torah? Torah is connected with the idea of a Jewish nation. In fact, we're actually told in Jewish law that we're not allowed to share Torah with non-Jews. It's a prohibition. 
this is the gift that the Almighty gave us to the exclusion of other nations. Thus, the intermediate 2,000 years is a time where our nation is flourishing. It's time of Torah, but really that hasn't really spread out to the rest of the world. We have Torah. Our nation is growing spiritually. The ideas that Abraham discovered, innovated, clarified to the world are really booming within our own people, but they're totally foreign in the world at large. And if you do the math from when Abraham comes to the world scene, there's essentially 2,000 years before the notion of one God becomes accepted by anyone outside of the Jewish world. And thus, there is this era of consolidation. There's, Abraham has this amazing discovery. He has Torah. Okay. But now there's 2,000 years of the Jewish nation, the descendants of Abraham, flourishing internally, but being completely isolated, insulated from the world around them. And then comes along uh, roughly the year 240 of the Common Era, and something that essentially started as an offshoot of Judaism. Of course, the early Judeo-Christians, they were just a sect amongst the Jewish people. And they started off as Jews that had a certain belief in the messianic potential of, of JC, but eventually they branch off, they sever their ties with the Jewish people, and they start their own religion. And yes, there's differences, theological differences between what we believe and what the Christians believe. But this idea, or at least a rough sketch of this idea of what Abraham started is now out in the world. And before you know it, several hundred years later, come along the Muslims. And according to Jewish theology, the Muslims are a lot closer to what we believe than the Christians. And before you know it, the Muslims take over the whole world, or most of the world, most of Asia, almost as far as China, all North Africa, the Middle East, vast swaths of Europe. And now it's not just an end of desolation, an end of the emptiness, and it's not just a Jewish nation, the the era of Torah. Now there is the era of Messiah that's underway. There's a beginning of dissemination of the Abrahamic principles that everyone in the world is coming into contact. And many people, the huge portions of the world are adopting as true the basic framework of what Abraham taught. There's widespread dissemination of monotheism. Concurrently, there's widespread abandonment of paganism. Even today, where there are people that don't believe what Abraham taught to the world, but they also don't believe the idea of multiple pagan gods. And thus we see that's kind of the next step, which we are in middle of, which is the completion of this big picture of what Jewish history and world history is all about. This triality, these three iterations of existence is manifested in the lives of the patriarchs. So, for example, Abraham, what does he represent? He's the one who discovered the idea of monotheism, and he ended the first period of emptiness. Where is Abraham born? Abraham is born outside of Israel. He's born amidst idolatry. But what does he do? He discovers it, and he travels to Israel. Isaac, well, he's the middle period. Isaac himself, he's born in Israel, and he's never allowed to leave. In fact, he wants to leave. There's a famine, and God says, no, you're not allowed to leave. Now is the time of deepening, of integrating the ideas of Abraham. You're not allowed to leave the land of Israel. Jacob, well, he represents the third role of Jewish history, the idea of dissemination, the idea of spreading out. He's born in Israel, like Isaac before him, but he goes out and he goes in various different places. He goes east, he goes south, he travels, and his children, of course, are going to travel too. Similarly, Abraham, well, he, at a very advanced age, he circumcises himself. Isaac, 
he's the first one to be circumcised at eight days of age. What happens with Jacob? Says the Talmud, he was born circumcised. He already got what Abraham and Isaac themselves worked so hard at. But what does he do? Or what do his children do? They go out and they circumcise the whole town of this, the, the whole town of Shechem. In that episode where the daughter of Jacob was kidnapped, and they go and they circumcise the non-Jews. They take these ideas. That's kind of the, the third component of this world history. They take the ideas and they spread it to the world. This maybe would explain the Torah's unusual treatment of, of Isaac. You know, Isaac is the hero of, or at least he's one of the heroes of the Binding of Isaac episode. He was willing to die for God as much as his father was willing to kill him for God. But the Torah only highlights Abraham's role. He's the one who is lauded. Isaac is almost an afterthought. Everything that Isaac does seems to be done by the people. His wife, the whole chapter 25 tells a story of them finding a wife for Isaac. Well, that's done by someone else. Abraham sends Eliezer. Isaac is criticized. He loved Esau. He would eat from the meat that Esau would feed him. The Torah doesn't tell us almost anything about Isaac's greatness. And the reason why is because he represents this middle stage where everything is internal. There's nothing that's manifest to the world at large. He's flying under the radar. Similarly, the Jewish people were insulated during this interim period, quietly flourishing outside the purview of other people. And it is kind of fascinating to think about what this represents in in world history. You know, we figured out monotheism for 2,000 years, no one bought it. And we had came into contact with the, with great empires, with the Assyrians, with the Persians. The Greeks are very intelligent. The Romans, of course, very capable, very competent, and they don't buy it. We alone are the torchbearers of monotheism. And then almost overnight, once we enter into that third phase, things take off and explode everywhere. And this again, we see already in the roots of our history in the book of Genesis. And there's another theme here that we see. We like to call it third times the charm. Both res- with respect to the progeny of the forefathers and with respect to Jewish history, the first time doesn't always achieve the aims. The second time too, third time's the charm. So for example, Abraham, he has of course a son, Isaac, but he has another son, the wayward son, Ishmael. First time didn't work. Isaac, he's righteous. He has a son, Jacob, but he has a second son, Esau, who also goes a bit awry. Third time's the charm. All 12 of Jacob's children are righteous. Similarly, in Jewish history, the first commonwealth, the first time we conquered Israel, was great. 852 years. We had a temple for 400 some odd years of that time. Great. But you know what happened? Temple was destroyed. Jewish people were sent into exile. Well, what happened afterwards it only happened two times in the world history where a nation was added out from the land and they came back. Seven years later, they come back. They reestablish what's called, known as the second commonwealth. They rebuild the second temple and things are good until it too is destroyed. And the Jewish people are again sent into exile. And you know what? We came back. And we don't quite have a temple yet. But of course, one of the fundamental principles of Jewish philosophy is that we will get a third temple. And that, th- that third temple, third time's the charm. That's going to be the eternal, permanent temple that will never get destroyed. We will never be kicked out again. Again, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, first temple, second temple, third temple. There's a very long and strange episode with Isaac and the wells. We're told where, a- where Isaac lived and he goes to dig the wells, and the Philistines, they fill up the wells, and he digs it again, and he 
has the first waltz called a sec, and then there's a quarrel over that. There's the second waltz called sitna. There's a fight over that too. Oh, the third well. It's called rechovot, and there's no problem. And if you, we know the Torah is very sparing in its words. And it gives us this whole long paragraph about Isaac and these wells and the names of the wells and what happened to the wells and the fact that the people were quarreling over it and they filled the wells with dirt. What's going on over here? Says the Ramban. First of all, what we could see here is a theme that uh, sadly will rear its ugly head throughout Jewish history. You know, the one thing we need in the Middle East more than anything else is water. Who would fill a well in the Middle East? Who would say, you know, we have a perfectly good source of fresh water. Let's fill it up with dirt. Let's close it up. Let's seal it off. That's almost self-destructive hatred of the Jews. We see that already in Genesis, that there are going to be people who are hell-bent and gets making, making us suffer, even if it means that they suffer alongside us. Says the Ramban, these three wells refer to the three temples. For the first well is called Asek. Asek is the Hebrew word for quarrel, meaning that the first temple, it will have a quarrel. And that quarrel will ultimately lead to a war, which will lead to us being dis- being sent packing out of the land of Israel. The second one is called Sitna, meaning accusation, which is a much harsher term than Asek. In the second temple, says the Ramban, there's going to be non-stop accusations and recriminations culminating in the second temple's destruction. The third, well, it's called Rechovot, meaning expansion. That's a reference to God's promise in the book of Deuteronomy, that in the future, he will expand our land. We're going to have permanence. There's not going to be the fight, and we're going to have the temple, for once and for all. Now, the Midrash talks about Abraham. We know Abraham, 10 verses into his trip to Canaan, God tells him, go to Canaan, go to Israel. He gets there, things are great, for 10 verses. And then 10 verses later, he goes down to Egypt. And in, in Egypt, he's harassed. And terrible things happen to them. But he leaves with great wealth. The Midrash finds 11 parallels with this small episode that happened to Abraham. His trip to Egypt, exactly the same thing happened in the book of Exodus with the Jewish nation went down to Egypt. Again, whatever happened to Abraham happened to his children. He went to Egypt. They went to Egypt. Everything that happened to him in in Egypt, on his descent, on his way up when he was there, happened to the Jewish people centuries later. We're also told a lot about the character, Abraham's other son, Ishmael, which we know is a precursor to the Muslims. And it's interesting if you map out what the Torah tells us about Ishmael in various different junctures of his life, and particularly with his relationship with Isaac, it is very instructive to the relationship between the Jews and our cousins, the Muslims, even until today. So, for example, after Hagar, Ishmael's mother, is pregnant, she's harassed by Sarah, and she flees. And after she escapes, an angel appears to her, chapter 16 in Genesis, and gives her instructions. The first thing he tells her, is go back to your mistress, go back to Sarah, and submit yourself to her. Says the Ramban, what this is telling us is that the Jews will dominate the Muslims. Just like Hagar is going to submit herself to Sarah, Hagar's children are going to submit themselves to Sarah's children. And in fact, we know during the first temple era, during the second temple era, The Arabs lived in Israel under Jewish control. Indeed, they were submitted to the Jews. And maybe we could argue that some of the realities existing in the Middle East today are reflective of that relationship and that hierarchy. In addition, we're told 
that the angel promises her, your child will spawn a great nation. He will have many descendants. They will not be able to be counted due to how numerous they are. Today, one of every six humans to grace the Almighty's planet is a Muslim. Bill, more than a billion of them exist. Indeed, this blessing was fulfilled. It's been pointed out that every single year, on average, there's 25 million new Muslims that are either born or have converted, uh, which is an astonishing number given that the Jewish nation, what we're hovering around 14, 15 million, an entire block of people, that's 10 million more people than our entire nation, is added to Ishmael's count every single year. And of course, once the Muslims consolidated in the 7th century, they quickly created an empire larger than that of Rome. The angel also tells Hagar that, behold, you have a child within you, and you should call him Ishmael, Yishmael, God were here. Why? Because God had listened to your prayer. You have displayed a tendency towards prayer. And we know, until this day, you could drive on the highway. Sometimes you'll see Muslims getting out of their car, putting down a little carpet, and praying. You see it in airports, you see it all over the world. This idea that the, that, that, that Ishmael, later on, of course, but Hagar, they displayed a tendency towards prayer. That became endemic to their children. However, Hagar is warned. He is going to be, your son is going to be a wild man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he shall dwell amongst his kinsmen. Commentaries explain what we're told here. He's going to be a wild man, meaning he's not going to be civilized. He's going to be nomadic. We know that the Arabians, they they were all Bedouins. They lived in the desert. In addition, the commentaries explain his hand is in everything. Rashi tells us it means he'll have a proclivity for theft. People may not like him so much, but he will still be quite numerous. The Midrash tells us something interesting in its commentary of this characterization of Ishmael. It says, although other nations will plunder money, Ishmael will plunder souls. It's been speculated that maybe this Midrash is a reference to the heavy Arab involvement in the African slave trade. Alternatively, this idea that his hand is in everything can maybe be a reference to the oil-rich Arab lands. Everyone is dependent upon them. In addition, we're told that Abraham trained Ishmael in the ways of kindness, of generosity, and hospitality. In the episode where three pagan visitors, which really are angels, visit Abraham, we see how he trains his young son Ishmael to help. We read in chapter 18, verse 7, that Abraham ran to the cattle and he gave it to his son. And he said, prepare it for our guests. The ways of kindness and hospitality were imprinted into Ishmael and to his descendants by Abraham. And until today, one of the bedrocks of Arab culture and tradition is tremendous superlative hospitality. They go out of their way to treat their guests with honor and to be very generous towards them. In addition, we're told that Ishmael will have a demotion. He's going to lose what he thought maybe he deserved. Why? He's the oldest son of Abraham, after all. He thinks that he gets a double portion. He is the rightful heir of Abraham. Abraham is told four times by God, you will have the land of Israel. Ishmael, for 14 years, he's the only son of Abraham. Well, who gets the land of Israel in his eyes? That's his. Comes along a little baby. Everyone's delighted. There's one man in the room 
who's not so happy. That, of course, is Ishmael. And then God tells Abraham, Ishmael's going to be a great nation. Don't get me wrong. But he will not be your heir. Your true spiritual heir will be Isaac. And in fact, right before Abraham died in chapter 25 of Genesis, he makes it clear that while he gives gifts to all his other children, Isaac indeed is his true heir. In addition, it's one of those remarkable realities of of world history that for centuries, for millennia, the Jewish people were circumcised. We know that's, of course, a mitzvah commandment in the Torah. There was only one other group that had a tradition to circumcise their males. That were the Arabs. When Abraham in chapter 17 was instructed to circumcise himself and his children and his whole household, he circumcised Ishmael. That became a tradition amongst the Arabs. And maybe, this is me speculating here, the tendency towards martyrdom, even in uh, in terrorist activities, may also stem from Ishmael being a 13-year-old when he was circumcised, not complaining about it, willing to shoulder the pain and the burden for a cause, that too was passed off to his offspring, and that maybe might explain the tendency towards martyrdom. Now, as an adolescent, he's 16 years old, Isaac, his younger half-brother, is only two, and Sarah notices his behavior and she says, this, there's no way I'm allowing my son Isaac to grow up in the shadow of his older half-brother. She sees him that he is mitzachik, that he is frolicking. What does that mean? Says Rashi, three things. Number one, idolatry. Number two, illicit sexual activity. And number three, murder. And what's interesting is that throughout Arab history, these themes have been quite prevalent in their culture. For example, the Talmud, in the book of Kedushin, page 49b, tells us that there's 10 units of immorality that were given to the world. Nine of them, 90% of the immorality, says the Talmud, were taken by Arabia. The Talmud even talks about that the Arab women would dress very modestly. And perhaps that's not a coincidence. In a, in a society, in a culture with such rampant promiscuity, it's probably quite wise, if you want to save yourself, to dress very modestly. Ishmael himself was an idolater. And until Muhammad came around, all the Arabs were pagans, and Muhammad changed that. Which, ironically, may be reflective of the Torah's characterization of Ishmael that towards the end of his life, even though he began his life or his adulthood in the ways of idolatry, but he deviated from that and he actually returned. He repented and returned to the ways of Abraham, to the ways of monotheism at the end of his life. Similarly, the Jew, the, the, the Arab nation, they were pagans for a long, long time, but then they changed and they became monotheists again. And lastly, we're told that Ishmael had a tendency towards murder. And he actually tried to kill Isaac to rid himself of the pest who was imperiling his inheritance. And we all know that Muslims tend to have a murderous streak to them. In fact, the Gahazwa is a name for the culture of glorifying bloodshed that is part and parcel of the Islamic way of life. But there's another villain that we meet in Genesis. Besides for Ishmael, we of course have Esau. Jacob has a twin brother. His name is Esau. And before they're even born, they already are jostling in utero, each struggling for primacy over the great cosmic conflict that is at stake. Rebecca, their poor mother, has twins in her womb, And they're going crazy. They're fighting. And she goes to the prophet. And the prophet tells her, 
there are two nations in your belly and two kingdoms from your innards will separate one nation will struggle with the other nation and the elder one shall serve the younger one. Rashi and the rest of the commentaries that understand this as a reference to the titanic struggles between the Jewish nation and Rome and the Jewish nation and the Christians. Says Rashi, quoting from the Talmud, these two realities, Jacob, Esau, number one, they really are represented, Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus, the head of the Jews, the head of the Romans. These are the spiritual descendants of Jacob and Esau. Moreover, Rashi tells us, and this is again from the Talmud, that these two nations cannot coexist. When one is up, the other is down. When one is down, the other is up. And it is axiomatic in Jewish philosophy that Esau is the forbearer of Rome and by extension of Christianity. Now, how does that work? How is Esau, Edom, a Semitic people? How do they end up in Europe, in Italy, in Rome? After all, Europe was populated by the descendants of Japheth. Noah had his three sons. Ham went to Africa. Shame. The Semitic people went to Asia. And Japheth went to Europe. So this idea that is so axiomatic in Jewish, in Jewish philosophy, Jewish history, that Esau equals Rome equals the Christians, where does that come from? So Rashi tells us in chapter 36, verse 43, when it lists the descendants of Esau, it lists someone by the name of Magdiel. Says Rashi, he, Romi, this is Rome. The Ramban he has a different take of how Esau ended up in Rome. And he talks about the son of Esau, whose name was Eliphaz. He got into a war with Joseph. How so? When they were trying to bury Jacob, Esau's son said, no, 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 you can't bury Jacob here. This is the, this last spot is reserved for my dad. They got into a war. And Eliphaz's son, his name was Tzapho, he was put into prison. When Joseph died, he escaped, and he escaped to, to Europe. And eventually, he made his way to Italy, he consolidated power, and even though he was an outsider, he was a Semitic person, he became the first king of Rome, and that is how Esau's influence went there. Alternatively, the third understanding of how Esau ended up in Rome comes from the Gra, the, the Gona Vilna, in his commentary to the book of Esther. He explains that Sancheirev, the king of Assyria, when he resettled all the captured people, when, of course, he resettled the ten lost tribes, when he resettled everyone, he placed Adam, the descendants of Esau in Europe, in Rome. It's interesting. The grandson of Esau, the son of Eliphaz, his name is Amalek. And as we know from the book of Exodus, the great foe of the Jewish people is Amalek. When the Jewish people leave Egypt during the Exodus, there's only one nation willing to attack them, and that's Amalek. Where we are given a commandment to never give up the struggle, never yield, never surrender to Amalek. Where is Amalek now? It's an interesting, tantalizing question. Says the Talmud, something very striking. This is from the Talmud, the book of Megillah, page 6a and b. It quotes a verse. The verse says, the verse in Psalms, where it's a prayer to God, not to allow Esau to fulfill his evil desire. Says the Talmud, what is this evil desire of Esau? This refers 
to Germania of Edom, to Germany of Edom. Meaning that in the Germanic tribes lies part of Edom, part of Esau, and should they go forth, this is a quote from the Talmud, and this is 2,000 years ago, nearly 2,000 years ago, should they go forth, says the Talmud, they would destroy the whole world. The Talmud tells us there's a certain force of Esau. According to tradition, this is Amalek. They move themselves to Germany, and they have something within them that wants to destroy the whole world, and comes along King David and prays, don't allow them to fulfill their evil desire. In effect, we could argue that there's a direct link here from Esau and his people in Edom and how they ended up in Germany straight to the Nazis. Now, the conflict with Esau and Jacob begins very early. They're struggling in utero. Right away at birth, we're told that Esau is a redhead. What does it mean? In Jewish philosophy, redhead is always a reference to a murderer. Esau's out first, but Jacob is grabbing onto Esau's ankle, meaning that although Esau may have a head start, although it may look like he will ultimately triumph, in the last second, Jacob will overcome and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Now, there's many, many interactions, confrontations, conflicts between Jacob and his brother Esau. But the most pronounced narrative of that is when after Jacob usurps the blessings, he escapes and he spends many decades away from Jacob and from his par- from, from Esau and from his parents. And then he returns. And there's an entire portion in the Torah in chapter 32 dedicated to Jacob's confrontation with Esau when he's about to meet him again. And in fact, in the late 1970s, Menachem Begin, who was the Prime Minister of Israel, he was in the United States for the Camp David Accords. And he was, he was scheduled for weeks of meetings with Anwar Sadat and Jimmy Carter. And eventually, of course, they hatched the agreement, the peace agreement between, between Israel and, and, and Egypt in 1979. But on his way to Washington, he stopped off in New York. And in New York, he met three of the greatest rabbis of the time. He met Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He met Rabbi Joseph Salavechik. And he met the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And all three of them, he asked them the same question. What do I do? How do I make sure I don't mess up in my negotiations here with Anwar Sadat and the Egyptians? And all three of them independently gave him the same answer. All three of them said, review the Torah portion of chapter 32 of Genesis when Jacob was about to meet with his arch rival, with his nemesis, with his formidable foe Esau, study his tactics, how he went about doing it, and follow his lead. So what does Jacob do? The first thing he does is he sends messengers to Esau. And his message is one of peace. It's one of reconciliation. And it's one of humility. He tells his messengers, Thus shall you speak to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I'm your servant. I have sojourned with Laban. I stay there until now. And he gives him the whole story. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. It's not a very bombastic message. It's a very humble one. You're my Lord. I'm your servant. I'm not looking for a fight. How does Esau respond? The messengers come back to Jacob. We came to your brother Esau, and he's also coming to meet you. And he has 400 warriors with him. Jacob reaches out for peace. Esau responds with the rattling of swords. Says the Ramban something very interesting. He says that Jacob actually made a mistake. Jacob should not have sent messengers 
to Esau, why would you awaken the beast? Don't let Esau know that you exist. Let him forget about you. Try to be invisible. Don't raise his ire. He gives an example. It's like someone who is trying to hold both ears of the dog. If there's a wild rabbit dog, you don't grab it by the ears. And then he gives an example. He says, in, in the first century before the Common Era, there was a civil war in the Hasmonean dynasty. There were two Hasmoneans, Hasmonean kings, Hierarchus and Aristobulus. Both of them wanted to be king. And there was a civil war. And they decided to invite the Romans to mediate their disagreement. And Pompey came in and he mediated their their disagreement by saying, okay, now this is a vassal state of Rome. It would have been much better for all involved if you don't tell the Romans anything. Let them not know that you exist. Don't try to reach out to them. Jacob, in fact, according to the Ramban, made a mistake by even reaching out to Esau, even if it was a humble gesture. Now, there's an interesting midrash here that tells us about a letter that Rabbi Judah the Prince dictated to his counterpart in Rome, Antoninus, who most likely is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the Roman emperor from 161 to 180. The midrash tells us that Rabbi Judah the Prince said to one of his colleagues, write a letter in my name to our master, the emperor Antoninus. So the scribe does as told, and he starts writing a letter. From Judah, the Nasi, the president of Israel, to our master, Emperor Antoninus. So Rabbi Judah the Prince says, no, 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 this is not how you write the letter. He grabs the letter, rips it up, right instead like this, he tells him. From your servant, Judah, to our master, Emperor Antoninus. So the scribe, he says to him, I don't get it. You're the president of the Jewish people. You're the greatest rabbi and the richest Jew around. Why would you humble yourself? Why would you dishonor yourself to write that you're a servant? So Rabbi Judah the Prince responded, Am I any better than our grandfather? Our grandfather, Jacob, when he was reaching out to Esau, he says, You're a servant, Jacob. I too will follow his lead. This idea that we're invincible, this idea that we could have this bravado with this assurances that we've got it, it's actually not the Jewish way according to history, but also according to the guidance that we're receiving here. This idea that, oh, we could finesse, we could muscle our way out of our problems. We're not the Jews of yesteryear. We're not going to sit back and allow others to dictate us. We're, we're tough. We, we, we could defend ourselves. We've got it. That's not a theme that we see here as appropriate for the Jewish way. Jacob, the first thing he did, he prayed. The second thing he did, he tried to avoid the conflict by sending a bribe, sending an appeasement. And only the last resort was that of warfare. And in fact, we know quite recently, uh, in during the Holocaust, there were some Jews and certainly those with a Zionist street to them, that said, no, we're not going to bribe. We're not going to lower ourselves. In fact, there was one famous Zionist who said that I'd rather have a cow in Palestine than a Jew in Warsaw. And those themes of not trying to save as many Jews as you possibly can, not worrying about the human toll of warfare above all else, like Jacob did. Those themes are antithetical to the Jewish perspective. Uh, the Ramban adds that during the siege of Jerusalem, in the end of the 60s of the Common Era, the city of Jerusalem is besieged by the mighty Roman Empire. And the Talmud tells us, we know this from historical sources as well, that there was ample supply of food and fuel. Jerusalem had a good water supply. Jerusalem had impregnable walls. They could have survived the siege for decades. But there was a group of zealots, 
a group of ruffians who said, no, 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 we want to fight. And they deliberately sabotaged the food storages, the fuel storages, and they caused widespread death, hunger, and devastation. That's not the way of the Jews in warfare. We want to make peace. We're willing to swallow our hat, to eat our pride, to embrace humility like Jacob did, lower ourselves, save face, but save lives. After Jacob navigates his confrontation with Esau successfully, Esau says, you know what? Why don't we be friends? Why don't we live together? And that is the second conflict that Esau presented. There's one, Esau, the enemy, and two, Esau, the brother. The relationship that the Jews have had throughout history with Esau, with Rome, or with Christianity, has been a double-edged sword. On one hand, there's been all kinds of terror, persecution, mistreatment, blood libels, expulsions, inquisitions, things like that. We've had to deal with Esau the wicked. I would say today, the greater threat is not Esau the wicked, it's Esau the brother. Where after we navigated one threat, now they want to be friends. Esau wants to tell Jacob nowadays, okay, we're brothers, let's live together and let you lose what makes you distinct, what makes you unique. On one hand, there's a threat of anti-Semitism, which brings within it all kinds of suffering. On the other hand, there's the olive branch of love, which sadly could lead to assimilation. Now, there's many more instances, incidents where the actions of the forefathers foreshadowed the future events and the struggles of their descendants. So, for example, there's the whole episode with Jacob and his father in law Laban and all the various tricks that his father in law tried to do to him. Jacob has a struggle with Esau's angel. There's going to be an element of religious persecution that Esau will perpetrate against Jacob. Jacob, even though he was the rightful owner of the firstborn right, he had to resort to trickery and deception to get what he deserved. Even though he legally bought the birthright, he had, he had to extract it by chicanerous means. In addition, we're told that we're going to have material and financial abundance. Jacob, after all, stole the blessings. Yes, he deserved them. But he got them, however he got them. But Isaac told him, God will give you from the dew of the heavens and the fatness of the earth and plenty of rain and wine. People will serve you. Nations will bow before you. There are some perks of being part of Jacob's clan. Esau, of course, is going to want to murder Jacob, just like Ishmael wanted to murder Isaac. And that too, sadly, has been the legacy of the Esau-Jacob relations throughout history. Jacob himself, in his life, is quite uncertain about the fate of his children. He thinks Joseph is killed. Joseph is certainly gone. Benjamin is taken. Reuben is suspected of sin and other impropriety. Simeon and Levi display Esau's characteristics. But in the end, everything comes together. In the end of Jacob's life, and of course for us, we're still in the middle of this, but in Jewish history, the future perspective is that just like it came together for Jacob at the end of his life, so too it will come together for his descendants, for the Jewish nation, and the culmination of the 2,000 years of Messiah. This perspective, I think, offers us a fantastic and very relevant view of the episode's of Genesis, but also gives us very prescient and valuable guidance on the right and wrong ways to navigate the situations that our nation is sometimes placed into.